All right, we are back with James Donnelly in beautiful downtown Fort Lauderdale, my home for many years, which I where I miss my home on the water. Also, by the way, um, so but visit often. Um, James, you have a, a diverse background, um, educated in finance at a school I know well, Carleton University, um, great Canadian college, and um, your CPA previously with um, Arthur Anderson, which was them and two shots at the time that I was choosing between. Um, way back when, and you're obviously a successful entrepreneur in the financial and investment arena. Can you share with us how you've evolved in your career? And are you now at the, this is where I wanted to be when I grow up pit point? Yes. Well, yeah, you know, um, it evolves. It does evolve. I will tell you that it began by starting at a very humble place and, uh, we grew up, you know, lower middle class, never had anything new. And I, I always say my parents gave me the gift of want. I just wanted more. So my initial motivation was highly financial. I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30 and all of those types of things. And it was good. It drove me at that at very young age. And I met all those goals. But what you learn as you get older is life is simply one big calibration. And so I, I think it was Anthony Robbins I read about the success cycle that come up with a plan, implement the plan evaluate the plan, make adjustments, and then you go through the cycle again, and, and that is never-ending. So that's why we say life is is literally one big calibration, and and that's been true for me. Every time I I made a decision, I, I'd go implement it. I succeeded or I failed. I adjusted, and, and here we are at 54 in a, in a wonderful place. Absolutely. So is that a plan word so that life is a cabaret was really supposed to be life is a calibration? Yeah, I, I probably right. <laughs> I, I always uh, say that uh, the quality of your life is equal to the quality of the decisions you make. And uh, that's true. By the way, that's true of business as well. Absolutely. But people fear making decisions. But if they buy into the success cycle, you know that your decision won't be perfect, but make it, calibrate it, and, and, and you're moving on. And what I always say to especially younger people, Mark, is – there should be an inverse relationship between age and risk. So if you're young, take the risk. Right. Do the, you know, Make the decision. It doesn't matter if you fail. You just get back up and go. Obviously, at my age, you know, I've, I've got myself in a wonderful place, and you, you, there's just no reason to take on the risk that I did when I, when I was younger. Yeah. That, not, that, not that I'm that old, Mark. Well, if you're that old, then I'm the same old also, so we're, we're not going to go there. <laughs> but it's uh, – it's it's great points. It's funny how people, especially young people, you know, they they feel the pressure to decide what they want to do. And in this day and age, you know, the the what do you want to be when you grow up? Bit in this day and age, it seems like I never I never grew up saying I'm going to be a headhunter. And my guess is you probably never grew up saying you're going to be doing exactly what you're doing, right? Well, you know, my career, I was you know McDonald's manager to uh, college student to CPA to entrepreneur investment company to property management to now angel investor and a lot of my time is you know giving back community philanthropy so I, I would not have predicted that uh, path but I'm not surprised at the outcome that's awesome uh, so you co-founded really one of the fastest growing investment firms in Canada if I'm not mistaken um, Related to our firm, you know, our firm focuses on attracting what we, the two words we use the most is the right fit individuals for our clients to become a winning team. And can you describe what it was like to create your business and to create a culture, like you said, having John Inc., etc., to create a culture able to grow fast and be successful with success being different things as well? Well, you know what, Mark, um, again, referring back to Jim Collins' books, um, Good to Great, Built to Last, and the one that's most recent, Great by Choice. He, they studied uh, great companies that survived over a long period of time to figure out what were what was the commonality in these companies. And what they found was that there was an immovable core of who the company was and constant innovation. And so 20 years ago in our firm, the Catholic group, sorry. It's okay, it's real life. It's real life. <laughs> Didn't shut that off, did I? <laughs> um, what Colin said 
was that uh, you, you had to have this immovable core and constant innovation. So 20 years ago, we created something called the Castle Constitution. We literally wrote out our purpose, our vision, our values, and our code of conduct. And then we hired people that we felt reflected that. And obviously, you're not right every time. We do an incredible orientation the first Wednesday of every month. You come in here, you get literally indoctrinated in, in who we are. So my comment about culture is you have to be deliberate. You have to choose it and make sure you hire people that that appear to reflect that and then constantly reinforce you know who you are in that in that instance but you also have to make sure that people who come into your organization that obviously aren't living it don't don't last in your in your company we find it very self policing people know when they come if we've made a mistake and they come in our firm and they don't fit the culture i mean half the time they leave because you know they've made a mistake they've chosen the wrong firm in addition in addition to us choosing the wrong person. No, it's actually brilliant because um, in, in our firm, and even as we expand right now, we've got our, what we call our why, and we've got our mission, and we've got the values and who we are, how we want to rep be represented, et cetera, that if you don't, I clearly believe, and I talk to clients about this all the time, if you don't have that foundation, you're like you're like treading water, you're sinking in sand, it, it, it doesn't work. And bringing on new people, great people love that, and not great people don't like it, basically. Um, so you can tell the difference. And I was just recounting this story about a fellow you would know, um, Mark Messier, because um, I was actually with Luke Robitaille last night at a sports event. And we were talking about how Mark Messier used to go face-to-face -face with his peers, his fellow players on the team, um, like an umpire and the manager, that close, and say, look, we want you. We're here to win a championship. We want you. We need you. I need to know, are you in or not? Either way, I just need to know now. <laughs> That's direct. Yeah, it was direct. But they knew he wanted to win, and they knew he wanted them. So it, there, it was their choice, basically. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cool story, and uh, he was quite a leader, to say the least. He was. Um, so now you're a leader in the, if I describe it right, the community association industry. Um, you're based in Florida. Don't have to go through the, the, the cold weather in Canada any longer. Or as I say, visit winter is a lot more fun. Um, and you, you have your leadership and your management philosophies basically in place in a foundation. Have they changed over the years um, for different reasons? I think so. I like to use continuums to describe uh, leadership qualities and we uh, at Castle provide a seven week leadership course to our top 25 employees every year and so uh, let me give you some examples you, there are democratic very consensus based uh, leaders that's on one end of the, the continuum and then you have the, the absolute autocrat uh, that would be on the other end of, of a continuum and so I probably moved slowly over time to be very democratic and consensus based and, and what I've learned just recently is I went too far in that continuum hmm. and I have become a little more prescriptive than perhaps I was I'd always go to my team what do you think what do you think well maybe what they think is not what in my opinion and I'm the, the CEO is the right thing and at that, at that point you have to be prescriptive but the bottom line is this if you do what's right, if you do the best you can, if you avoid bad people, <laughs> um, if you if you know what you're good at, uh, then then that, that that's going to be a, a a great leadership style, and it's very uh, personal. Um, but a couple other things that I think, mm -hmm. in, in terms of you know leadership qualities that maybe I've learned or grown into. As, uh, let me use an example of a revenue model. If you look at all of the businesses I'm involved with, I like recurring revenue, right? So right. I, in a management business, you sell a management contract and they pay you every month for literally, we have one now for 35 years. Other uh, leaders and businesses complete, choose a completely different model, but we know this is who we are. And similarly, when I go out to, to promote our business to clients in a competitive environment, they say, well, what makes you different? You have to be able to answer that question. At our, our firm, we hire the best people. We're, you know, 
we really, we're people first certified. We, we have something called Royal Service, which is our Ritz-Carlton type customer service program. And then, but we think people are imperfect because we are. So we put incredible <laughs> systems in place um, and we tie them together with technology. So if people ask me, you know, what makes Castle different? We say, look, we hire the best people, we have the best systems and we, we marry them with technology. If you can't answer for your firm, those types of things, then then I think you've got a problem internally and externally. The market doesn't know who you are and your team doesn't know where you're going. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. And, and that falls right in line with um, when we talk with clients too. It's all about right fit because at the end of the day, you can always find qualifications. And if you're talking to great people, they'll all be able to do the job at the end of the day. So who is the right fit for your values, for your, you know, everything you talked about? And, um, and it's critical. You know, one thing I love about getting a little tired of saying younger people all the time. But one thing I like about younger people is they're not as interested so much in the, in the stuff like the bigger house, the better car, this or that they want experiences. And I think it's spectacular because they want experiences at their careers, at their work and at, at home and everything they want to remember that we talked at the beginning of this one thing about enjoy life, which then makes their business performance even better. Um, any comments about that, that, that whole mindset that seems to be, I'm coming. You know, it reminded me of a, a point I wanted to make. Um, we have about 1,100 employees here at Castle, and obviously, uh, lots of younger uh, employees and teammates. And what I hear and read in the media is how the millennials just aren't, don't have the work ethic, just aren't, don't have the soft skills that that we older folks did. And that's absolutely not our experience. I could not be more impressed with the young people we're hiring, they're interested, they're curious, they're hardworking. I will agree with you. They seem to be more experiential and have a better life balance than we did, but could not be more impressed with uh, the next generation coming into our business anyways. Yeah, I, I, to I actually totally agree. I mean, there's going to be exceptions, but um, I totally, agree. if you, if you know, if you, if you create the opportunity, the great people will come and they'll want it basically. And then you just got to determine the you know the right fit. I'm invigorated every time I go up to Palo Alto and see what some of these kids are doing. It it, it blows my mind. Um, true visionaries. You know, it's one thing to disrupt an industry which takes a lot of a lot. It's another thing to actually vision you know envision something that doesn't exist yet and and make it happen. And uh, so no, I, I I agree. Young people are doing some fantastic stuff, and um, just got to keep um, keep encouraging them. Um, you, as you mentioned, you're involved both in business and you've got a lot of community in your life. Pay back, pay forward. Um, with respect to that, you know, this may, may be stating the obvious, but what advice do you give to young up-and-coming leaders on how to prepare for their future? I think the uh, challenge we have, especially for the young leaders now, is we've become such a uh, digital world. Uh, distractions are unbelievable. We literally, you know, we have our phone in our hand 24 seven. We have our iPad, we have emails coming at us. It's just what we don't do is stop and think what we don't do is calm our mind. And so I, you know, my advice to, to the next generation is you need to carve out, think and um, calm your mind time because the world will not let that happen. Uh, as, as you heard my phone ring a moment ago, <laughs> The other thing I think if I look at myself, what, what characteristics in myself allowed me to go from, you know, relatively nothing to an incredible life, I would say the number one thing is a curiosity that's to this day insatiable. I mean, even talking to you, Mark, you know, I know you're interviewing me, but I'm listening to you and I'm learning from you and every everyone I talk to. We call it uh, sharpening the saw. So I'll sit with a leader in my firm and they'll say, you know, James, how can I, you know, get to the next level? And I'm going, you know what? How many books did you read last month? Oh, I, I, I didn't. Well, how many, you know, like courses did you go to? How, like, how did you learn more last month? Well, well, I didn't. I said, then you had no chance. So I'm a voracious leader, a, a reader. I, um, I listen to tapes. Tomorrow we're going to see Jack Welsh up in Palm Beach where you and I met oh, uh, cool. last month. <laughs> And, uh, and I've never listened to Jack Welch speak. I know he was a great guy and I know he's older, but I'm going to learn something tomorrow. I don't know what it is yet, but, but I will. So think, be curious, sharpen the saw, never stop. Yeah, it's, it's great. If you get a chance, ask him um, 
I went to Phoenix and I, I talked to him actually, but it was on on a on a conferencing thing, not in person. It was in person, but not physically in person. He's got a company called Evaluate to Win, and he's got his Jack Welch Institute as well, and it's a whole program on, if you will, winning and 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 had and had to do it and uh, plenty to learn from him. Everybody might not agree on everything he did, but there's still plenty to learn. So I I, I totally agree, and we need we need more reading. It actually. It actually helps your mind operate in a different way, um, you know, than, than just watching all the time. So, I'm I'm with you there. Um, some personal questions, not too personal, but personal. Um, um, do you guys have a pet? We don't. We do not have a pet. We always had a cat. Um, as I think you know, I I moved from a home to a a, a high rise condominium um, recently, and our poor uh, pet cat Chip. Uh, uh, passed away just literally a month before we moved into a condo which not that it's a good thing he passed away but he had this beautiful big home and he was about to live in a condo so I think the timing is perfect but um, I'm looking forward to my my children's pets I don't think we'll have another one there you go well you know I guess I guess your cat had a maybe had a heart attack thinking he doesn't want to go to a condo <laughs> I don't know I get uh I have three dogs and one's almost 15 now and it's uh it's 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 something I'll tell you. Do you have a favorite activity or sport? Well, uh, Canadian, as you know, although I am, uh, I, I must say, an American citizen now, I'm very proud of it. Um, as well. But uh, yes, I, I play ice hockey is my primary sport. Have since I was a kid. I'm here in Florida, so we we have the Florida Panthers nearby, and their um, their practice facility, uh, the Panthers Den. I play twice a week. <laughs> and then I have a, a home in Quebec at Mont Tremblant. And I am an active, active uh, skier. And um, as I said, I, I read um, all the time. And uh, I'm actually writing a book right now. So between those four things, my family and business and philanthropy, uh, I sit on a few boards. There are not many um, <laughs> moments where I'm not doing something. Well, you do leave yeah. time just to be, though, right? I do. Absolutely. Um do you have a favorite movie or TV show? You know, I don't. I, I mean, I, lo I love movies. I watch all the, the, the movies that, that come out. I mean, there's some classics that, that come to mind. But what I find is there's so much TV now with Netflix and, and um, Amazon Prime and whatnot that uh, my wife, we tape everything. Yeah, right? we do. We watch it on, on Netflix. Um, but... Really, the more it's the uh, reality at TV that I like. You know, we'll watch, um, <laughs> no. uh, you, you know, the American Idols and The Voice, and they're just such compelling stories. These these people that <laughs> are just trying to live their dream. It, it's what I don't like to watch. I just made this observation recently: is um, like The House of Cards, which is a fantastic series. I know, but it was so negative. Every time I shut it off, I. I felt worse than when I turned it on, so I said to my wife, I'm not going to watch this anymore. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the other night I was watching, uh, I think it was Kelly Clarkson sing this incredible song, and uh, because she was a guest judge. No, oh, I heard that. It was, it was so uplifting. I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to watch this, and I am going to watch this. I mean, one one thing I'd say to anyone that's watching this video, like, just keep the negativity out of your life. Um, well, if you keep watching CNN and Fox and that, you'll have plenty of negativity. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, and it actually, you know, um, it does bring you down or up. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, how, you know, however, you know, I'll watch a Rocky movie that I've seen 42 times, and it's still, I'm still turned on, even though I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, well, you mentioned books. Jim Collins sounds like a favorite with respect to books. How about music and food? You know, uh, on the music front, you know, I I grew up in the 70s, and and I'm a huge and now, of course, with um, XM, you can literally watch, put it on 70s and, uh, and and listen to it. But having said that, I mean, a lot of the current music it, it just seems to be almost gone back to the 70s in terms of genre. I mean, it's easy listening. It's soft rock. Um, love that. And uh, on uh, the book side, I, uh, I'm i a Jeffrey Archer fan mm. from a, a fiction perspective. Mm -hmm. And... On nonfiction, the most recent book I, I read was called uh, Primary Greatness by uh, Stephen Covey. And it was actually uh, uh, written after he passed away tragically in that bicycle accident. By his kids, they, they took all his unpublished papers and they put it into this book. 
and of course everyone should read Covey's because he's you know one of the greatest but it was really neat at capturing all you know his I think he was 79 this was his 79 years of wisdom in one book it's called, called primary the, what greatness oh, okay because I, I love Stephen Covey you know I had the opportunity of being on a couple of um, webinars with him and um, a lot of them talking about trust and building trust, etc. It was brilliant, brilliant. So, so great stuff. Um, well, last little question: What about food? Favorite food? Oh yeah, um, it's, it's funny. You know, we Kathy and I are not foodies. We literally won't go to a restaurant unless we're with other people. If it's just us, we stay at home. We love our wine. By the way, forget about food. I love wine. <laughs> yeah. And so we eat. We eat incredibly healthy. We just—it's always like a, a as close to the plant uh, to, to the the ground as possible. Um, fresh fruit, fresh vegetable, uh, usually a fish or, or chicken, and very simple. Nothing added. Uh, we're the simplest, most boring eaters in the world, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're also incredibly healthy. There you go. That's that's the key. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing all that. 